are so excited that you guys are joining us. My name is Britt and I get the privilege of overseeing high school and young adult ministry. Yes, my name is Ashton and I'm a student at ACF Youth Culture and we are so glad that you guys chose to spend your Sunday with us and we, get, we want to give you a warm welcome. Yeah, and if you're watching on YouTube right now, we'd love to invite you to church online. Click that link in the description and that's going to be a more interactive experience because you're family. We want to engage with you. We also have an online host that at any time during this service, if you need prayer, they would love the opportunity to call out to Jesus for you. And maybe the pastor just says something that hits and you're like, I need to fire emoji this up because yes. God is speaking to me. Whatever that looks like, we want to engage with you. But Easter's seven days away. Seven days. I feel like January was literally yesterday. I know. Do you guys have any traditions or things that you do for Easter? We do. So uh, we go to the Good Friday service because Friday is good because Sunday is coming and I love that song. Um, and then on Easter day, we have our Easter egg hunt and we got our golden egg with the moolah in it. How much moolah? 20. $20? 20 dollars it's a golden egg yeah it gets aggressive is that because of inflation ask my mom i was gonna say wow <laughs> what else do you guys do and then to end the day we have a nice family meal and we just celebrate that jesus is alive Amen. yeah for us oh have you gotten your easter fit yet no <laughs> i'm late y'all make sure you got your easter fit ready i got mine 11 dollars at a thrift store Such yesterday a thank you lord um, but some of our family traditions, we go to a Good Friday service, but then one of the things that we do that I love is we have an Easter meal and we go around just saying all the things that we're thankful to Jesus for because he is not just God of sin and death and conquering that, he's God of everything and we have so much to give thanks and praise for. So we'll go around the table and we'll just say to King Jesus as we say the things that we're thankful for. But we are about to get ready to go into worship, but we want to hear from you, some of your traditions, yes. the things that you guys do. But Ashton, how can we prepare for this service? Man, let's not have an agenda because we have a big God. Let's not put him in a box as to how he can move. Let's start with open hearts, open yeah. minds, and just watch the Lord move. Yeah, let's get ready to go worship our God. We love you guys. Woo. Good morning, ACF. Let's stand. It's Palm Sunday. Praise the Lord.
cardio at church this morning. Amen. Well, if we haven't met, my name is Britt, and I get the privilege of overseeing our high school and young adult ministry. And I have a student joining me. Yes, that's me. My name is Ashton. Yeah, and we're going to go ahead and shift into a time of prayer. But Ashton, why does prayer matter? Man, prayer matters because it changes things. Our cries reach the ears and the heart of our Heavenly Father, and He does something about that. It's so effective and it's so powerful. And so if at any moment during the service you feel, I need to be prayed over, there's someone in the prayer room in the back that would absolutely love the privilege of lifting you up to Jesus. And for our online family, there's a host that would love that opportunity as well. Amen. And every week we bring a prayer before our body to call out to Jesus. And this week we're going to be praying for Nora Hamilton. Nora is seven years old and she's been having excruciating bone and joint pain. And they recently went down to Seattle and praise God, it's not cancer. So good. Thank you, Lord. But there's still a journey of next steps and, and healing. And we just know that this is hard. Not only for Nora, but the family, but we have a God who walks with us in the hard places. We have a God who's with us and a God who's healer as well. And so we want to call out for this family. And we'd love for you guys just to extend a hand as a sign of faith, but also just believing and asking our God as a body for this family. Yeah. Jesus, you're so, so good. God, you see Nora and you see her family and you see her situation and her pain. And we're here as a church family to lift her up to you in Jesus' name because you are a healer. You made the blind see, you made the deaf hear. So in Jesus' name, would you heal bo Nora's body back to complete restoration because you can, because you still do miracles. So would you do that in Jesus' name? God, I speak your joy and your peace and your healing over Nora and her family as they walk through this difficult season of life. Lord, thank you so much for hearing my prayer. You're so, so good. And as we jump into today's service, Lord, would you open our hearts, open our minds so that we don't have an agenda for what you're going to do because, God, you're going to move today. So Holy Spirit, come. Let us not have an agenda. Let us just be open to what you're going to do. I ask all of these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good, awesome, awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much, Colleen. Uh, my name is Cody. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at ACF, and uh, just so excited to be here with you guys today. And uh, one thing, too, just as I'm a, a former student pastor, I feel like most pastors at some point were a student pastor for some reason. And so one thing that I, I just love seeing today is seeing a high schooler on stage leading us in prayer and, and in doing that. Yeah, for sure. Because that's, that's also not like the next generation of the church. Like that is the church. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're in here and you're a, a kid or a student or whatever that looks like, that you are the church. And so that's, that's awesome that we get to pray together like that. Uh, but today we're going to be uh, looking at, uh, at Palm Sunday. Uh, that we're going to be in Luke chapter 19 this morning if you're following along in your Bibles or on your Bible apps. And uh, we're going to look at, at what Palm Sunday is, which if you don't know what that is, it's the Sunday before Easter. Uh, and so uh, it's really, this, this day really is the beginning of the end in the scriptures of Jesus' time here on earth. And so we're, we're jumping right in this morning seeing what does this mean, what does this day look like as Jesus is going into Jerusalem to, to, be, uh, uh, to be who he says that he is. And what does this mean for us 2,000 years later on the other end of this? How does Palm Sunday impact our lives here today in Alaska or if you're watching online, wherever you happen to be watching from? And, and what this can mean for us and as I was praying about this, this message and, and, and reading through the, the scriptures and, and seeing what it was that, that um, God had for us today, uh, one word that kept coming to mind for me is the word decide. Everybody say decide. decide. See, because uh, any decision that you make, every decision that you have ever made has led you up to this point of you either being here in the room or joining us online for this service. That everything that you've ever decided, every decision, every, every good decision, every poor decision, Everything that you have done has led you up to this moment. And so our decisions are actually really big deals. 
Like it's a big deal of what we decide to do or what we decide to believe or where we decide to go in our lives. And so that this word decide actually has a lot of weight behind it. I read recently that uh, the average person makes uh, 35,000 decisions every day. All right, 35,000. And so with that many decisions, you know, you're bound to make some good decisions. Uh, there, there's going to be a couple of good decisions that sneak their way in there, you know. Um, I've got um, a couple from my life. Uh, the, the list, uh, I feel like, is outweighed on the other end, but I've got some good decisions that I feel like I've made. Like when I uh, asked my, my then-girlfriend to be my wife, uh, that that was a, a good decision. Hopefully she also would put that in that side and in her life of uh, saying yes, but, uh, but that was a, a good decision uh, for me. But then I've also made some questionable decisions. Well, I like the word questionable better than bad. So let's, let's stick with that. And you've probably been there as well. Like, I think a few summers ago when my previously mentioned wife uh, somehow convinced me that I should shave my beard for the summer and just leave a mustache. And I thought, you know, what could go wrong? <laughs> a lot can go wrong. <laughs> So, so many things can go wrong. And I even, you know, I went to my barber and I told him like, hey, this is, this is what I want to do. I want to shave the beard all off. And he was just like, are you sure? And if your barber ever says that, scrap any plan you had when you walked in. Just be like, you know what? Never mind. Do whatever you want. Like you've lost your privileges to decide what any of this looks like for you. But I was just like, yeah, man, let, let, let's just do it. And he was like, okay. So we got the clippers and he started here and he shaved right there. And I was like, oh, this was a miss. Like, this was not good. Because I had forgotten, because I'd had a beard for so long, that I need a beard. Um, I, I, I forgot that I don't have a chin. And so if you, if you think of a, uh, like a Simpsons character who it just goes from their lip into their neck, that's, what, that's the lot I was given. And so a beard for me is a good decision. Shaving it off is a questionable decision. There, with that many decisions, 35,000 every day, there's going to be decisions that you make that are, maybe they're good, maybe they're questionable, you know, maybe some of them just seem inconsequential and it doesn't really matter one way or the other. You know, you might leave here today and you're going to have to decide if you're going to actually fold the laundry that's been sitting in your dryer for the last week. Or maybe tonight you're going to have to decide if you're going to keep scrolling through TikTok before it gets banned um, or if you're going to actually get some sleep before you have work tomorrow. Or maybe you're in here and you're carrying some pretty big decisions that have a lot of weight behind them that are going to change the course of your life. You know, maybe you came in here today and uh, you're, you're trying to make the decision of if you're going to actually keep pursuing this whole God thing or if there is a God that loves you. And this is your last chance today uh, that you're giving God to see if he's going to actually work in your life. You know, maybe you came in here today and you have to decide if you're going to keep fighting for your marriage or if you, if you think that it's just not worth fighting for anymore. Or maybe you're in here today and you've got some, some just heavy decisions to make for your family or for the people around you and you have to decide what you're going to do with that and you don't even know where to start. Or like every single decision that we make is leading us somewhere. So where are you going to decide to go? Because as we look at, at Scripture, and as, even as we look at the story of the, the whole Bible, uh, that what we see is that there's a lot of decisions that get made. There, there's a lot of good decisions of people pursuing God and, and people following after what God has set up for them. Uh, there's, there seems to be a lot more stories of people not following that and of people going their own way and of people not trusting what God has set up for them and, and deciding that they have something better for their lives that when we look at the very beginning of Scripture, we see that God creates everything. That there's this, this perfect and holy God that existed before everything else that decided that he wanted to share his love and his joy with a creation. And so then he creates everything that we've ever seen, everything that we've ever known was created by this God who had so much love that he wanted to share that with his creation. But then very, very quickly at the beginning of Scripture, we also see Adam and Eve decide that they have something better in mind. That they decide that they want, that what they think is right is actually better, and they go away from what God has called them to. And that brings in this separation between us and God. But God doesn't stop there, because God loves his creation. God, God loves what he has made, and so he decides that he wants to bring his people to himself. And so then God decides that even though his people keep making decisions to go away from him, God decides that he's going to send these leaders. 
He's going to send, send judges and kings and, and leaders to his people, this nation of Israel. And he's going to send them these people so that they can lead God's people back to him. But then we also see that these judges and these kings and these leaders that God set up originally to point people back to him actually make their own mistakes and go their own way. That they decide that they want the power God has given them for themselves. That they, they start to fall into sexual immorality and, and murder and greed. And they, they start leading people and themselves away from who God is. And so we see this pattern over and over again in Scripture of God deciding to love his creation and, and to, to pursue them but then seeing God's own creation decide to go away from him and away from what he has set up for them in the first place. But what's so good is that throughout this whole story, that every time God's people go away from him and every time God's people decide that they're going to do something different, that we see God keeps making these promises all throughout Scripture of this Messiah that is to come. That there's going to be this Messiah to come free his people and rescue his people. That they're going to come and and this Messiah is going to bridge this gap that has been created between God and his people. And he promises that that Messiah will come. But but before that, we just see people keep making these decisions to go their own way. And and I don't know about you, but I've been in that place where I had to keep deciding, like, man, what what is this going to look like for me? Uh, Because I didn't start following Jesus until later on in life. And so for me growing up, church and, and religion just wasn't really a thing that I did. And so my, my first experience at church that wasn't a, a wedding or a funeral, that was an, an actual church service, I still remember distinctly because I was seven years old and I didn't know I was going to church. All right, I stayed the night at a friend's house and they, they were going and so that meant I was going. So I got tricked and I was trapped. I had no way out of it. And I didn't know what to expect. Like, I grew up in the South, but I didn't grow up going to church, which, contrary to popular belief, is possible. And so I had no idea what was happening. So I show up with my friend and his family, and, you know, we're at this, you know, this traditional Southern Baptist church. So, you know, think people wearing suits, and, and the, the service is very kind of planned out, and everybody knows the different parts, uh, except for me. Like, I, I felt like I had showed up, and everyone had this secret, and I had no idea what the secret was. They, like, I, I, I really did feel like I was the kid that these, these, this family, their kid was hanging out with this, like, bad kid, so they drug him to church to try to fix him. Like, that's, that's how I felt. So I walk in, and everybody's wearing suits, and I've got on a T-shirt with a dragon on it. <laughs> and, and then we get inside, and everybody's talking to each other, and everyone knows each other, and I'm like, I have, no, I have no idea who any of these people are. And then, you know, the service starts and, and everyone starts praying. So I'm like, oh, I guess I should, I should bow my head. And so my head is down, but my eyes are up. Like my head's on a swivel this whole night because I'm like, I don't know. When do you know a prayer is done if you've never prayed before? And so I'm sitting there kind of looking around and then everyone's heads go up. So I'm like, okay, I guess my head goes up. And maybe this is where my anxiety started. I'm just realizing uh, but this probably... <laughs> It at least didn't help, I'm assuming. Um, you know, they get the, the hymnals out, and I'm like, I don't know what a hymnal is. Like, and so we're flipping through pages, and I'm like, dude, I can't keep up. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, if I don't understand what's happening, and I don't know what's going on, and, and there's no kind of guidance for, for me, at least in this situation, maybe all of this church stuff just isn't for me. Like, maybe this is why my family doesn't go, because this is confusing, and I don't get it. And so maybe God is for some of these people, but maybe this isn't a thing that, that I um, get to be a part of. And even a couple years later, I had a neighbor give me a Bible. So I was like, okay, maybe I'll try it one more time. You know, I enjoyed reading as a kid, and so I got uh, the Bible that he gave me. And so I'm nine years old, starting at the beginning of the Bible, which in my mind made sense. You start at the beginning of the book. So I'm reading Genesis in the King James Version at nine years old, which I don't recommend for anyone, um, much less a nine-year-old from Georgia where reading is already tough, and I'm trying to read old English about this Hebrew literature of how everything was created, and I was like, bro, I'm out. Like, I have, I have no idea what's happening. And those were my experiences with the church, and so for me, I just, I didn't, I wasn't a part of it. Like, I thought that there was no place for me in it, and so I didn't see how I could fit into that or how that there, there was even a God that wanted to, to know me or that, that did know me. And so I just, just kind of backed away from it. And all of that led up to me being in high school, and I remember riding around with a friend, and, and somehow we started talking about religion. And all of these things had led up to this point in my life where I just felt like that there, there weren't any answers. Like, I felt like, you know, everything just kind of is what it is, and, and we just get through this life, and then that's kind of it. 
And so I remember riding around with my friend, and we were talking about religion, and I remember saying, uh, distinctly remember saying, that religion is only for people who are afraid of dying. That I, I had just gotten to this point where I was like, there's really no other reason for it. Like, you know, if you're, if you're afraid of dying and you don't know what's going to happen, and then, you, then you have religion. And I was like, cool, do whatever you want. But I don't see how any of this is for me, and I don't, I don't really get that. And so I, I thought that I had somehow outsmarted the need for God. That I thought I had outsmarted this need for, for there to be anything uh, in my life that was providing hope or providing life because I didn't think any of that was possible or for me. And I, I ultimately didn't really think that it was needed. And I think a lot of us in here have either been there or maybe feel that way. And I, I think that there are people that we're going to read about in the scripture from, from Palm Sunday that were probably in that place but were confronted with Jesus and what he was doing at the time. Because you see, all of this brings us to Palm Sunday where um, you know, God has been promising throughout the scriptures of this Messiah to come that was going to come free his people. And so the, the Jewish people at the time in, in Jerusalem and, and, and abroad were under Roman oppression. The, the, the Roman Empire ruled everything. And so for the Jewish people, their idea of a Messiah at that point in time was going to be this king that would come and set them free literally from Roman rule. That they had heard all of these prophecies of a Messiah coming to set them free. And so for their circumstances and where they were at, that's what they were expecting to happen. And so then this guy, Jesus, comes around. And Jesus starts performing miracles. You know, he's feeding 5,000 people with this kid's lunch. He's walking on water. He's calming storms. He's healing lepers. He's, he's doing all of these, these incredible things. And so then word starts to get, get around. And then people start to think, maybe this is our guy. But maybe this is the Messiah. And, and he keeps talking about all of these, these, these things that, that he's going to do and the kingdom of God coming. And they're like, no, this might be our guy. And so that brings us to where we're at in the story in Luke chapter 19. That as Jesus is getting ready to enter Jerusalem for, for what we uh, now celebrate as Good Friday and Easter. But we're, we're seeing how all of this kind of begins this week before. So in Luke 19, starting in verse 28, this is how it's set up for Jesus to go into uh, Jerusalem. And it says, After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. And those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. All right, so Jesus is, is getting ready to, to enter into Jerusalem. And, and by a colt, it's talking about Jesus riding in on a donkey. And so he sends some of his disciples to go get a donkey for, for him to be able to ride into, which we'll get to here in a minute. But what I want to focus on is the fact that he keeps calling himself the Lord. Right, that this isn't the first time that he's done it, but, but he continues to call himself the Lord, and that would have been extremely controversial at the time. Because he's, by saying that he's the Lord, he's equaling himself with God, and that is extremely blasphemous unless it's actually true. And so people that are around him and that are seeing these things have to decide if they think that that's true or not. Because, because for us, in, in our context, that that's something that might be kind of strange if someone did that. Like if you're at Walmart after the service and I come up to you in the parking lot and I'm like, hey, really quick, um, I'm God and I need to go do something really big down in Anchorage. So I need you to go to this guy's house and just steal his donkey. He's going to be totally cool with it. And I need you to bring it to me so I can ride down to Anchorage and do something really big. You'd probably just be like, oh, okay, cool, man. Honey, get the kids. Let's like, and you would be freaked out and maybe a little weirded out, but it, you wouldn't maybe be offended by it or you wouldn't want to arrest me or anything. You would just think this guy is thinking about something totally different from what's actually happening. But for, for this time and, and in this moment that Jesus is equaling himself with God, and this would have been a huge deal. And this isn't the, the first time he's done it. This is just him doubling down on it. Where he's saying, no, I have something to do that, that none of you can even imagine, and I'm going in. So tell these people the Lord needs this, but the Lord is here. And the way the author C.S. Lewis puts it is that he says that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. That he is only one of those, and he can't be any combination of the others. Because either he's a liar, 
and he's just the greatest manipulator that's ever lived. And he's convinced all of these followers and all of these people uh, that he actually is the son of God. Uh, or he's a lunatic, and he really believes it for himself, but he's not actually who he says he is. And he just believed it so much that all these people started following him. But then the third option is that he is who he says that he is. That he actually is the Lord, and he is here for a purpose and for a reason. And so that's what these people that are following him had to decide, and that's what all of us also have to decide. That he can't be any combination of these things, that if he is not fully Lord, then he can't be anything to us. But if he is fully Lord, then he is everything to us. That there is, no, there is no combining things, there is no option for us that we don't get to decide what he is. We just get to decide what this is going to look like in our lives. Right? Because Jesus then keeps going and, and he has um, this, this donkey that he's riding in on. And, and as we uh, continue going, that, that we see this group of people, that they're, they're around Jesus and they're all in. But there are people worshiping and there are people going crazy, but it's because that there, a lot of them had this expectation that the, the Messiah that was to come was going to be this kind of warrior king, that he was going to come in and, and fight the Romans and fight this oppression that they were under, that he was going to come literally set them free from what they could see as actually holding them down. That they were under Roman rule, but they wanted to be a free nation. And so in their mind, they thought this Messiah was going to ride in and fight the Romans. That their, their version of the Messiah that they had created in their mind was this Messiah that was going to come in like Gerard Butler in 300. That he was going to have these like CGI abs and this, that weird rat tail kind of thing. And, and he was going to come in and he was going to fight the Romans and he was going to set the people of God free. And so they, 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 that's just what, this is what they're expecting. And so they're, they're getting hyped up. Like they they're, are getting ready for this to happen. And so that's what we see here starting in, in verse um, 35. It says, they, they brought it, being the donkey, to Jesus, uh, threw their cloaks on the colt, uh, and put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And so these people start worshiping and saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Right? These people are hyped. But they are like, let's go. Like, it's, it's happening. Like, like, the Messiah is coming in. He's riding into Jerusalem. Like, he is about to have his way, and he's going to overthrow this Roman oppression that we have been under. Like, they are, are so excited. But, but what they have mixed up is that they had a version of their Messiah in their minds, and they just put that onto Jesus. That they thought Jesus was going to be the Messiah, but they put their own version of what they expected onto this guy that they see going into Jerusalem. And so I think all of us in here, whether you've been a Christian for a long time or you, you are in here kind of checking out this whole God thing, I think that there are times where we can get this version of Jesus in our minds, and that's what we assume Jesus is. Right, maybe we have this version of Jesus that's like a politician. And uh, Jesus just comes and fights for our rights and, and no one else's. Right? It's, it's either people agree with us and, and what we think and, and that's what Jesus is for and, and Jesus has our vote. But if people disagree with us or people have different views on something, then they obviously don't love Jesus like, because this is what Jesus does. And this is why Jesus has my vote. And I've got Senator Jesus in my life. And, and that's the, the version of Jesus that we have created and that, that we build up in our minds. You know, maybe you think of Jesus uh, as a genie. And that's a, a version that you um, have created where we need something or we want something. And, and we just ask Jesus for it. And that's what he is there to do is just give us the things that we think that we need. And we actually miss out on this relationship with Jesus because we've turned it into a transaction with Jesus. That we just ask God for things and we're like, God, I, would, I was pretty good this week. Like, I, I did some good things that, that maybe this is, like, you can give me this because I did some good stuff. And so we have a, a genie version of Jesus or the, the version that I think that I've fallen into the most in my life is a gym partner Jesus. 
and uh, gym partner Jesus is, is kind of, he's, he's around, you know, but you go into the gym, you put headphones on because the gym is no place for conversations. And, and so you go in and, and you acknowledge that Jesus is there and you go and kind of do your own thing and, and set up the stuff that you need. But inevitably you put too much weight on the bar or at some point it becomes too much for, for you to lift on your own. And so you're, you're there struggling under this weight that you're now experiencing. And who's there? Your boy Jesus. He's always there. He's always good to give you a spot. He comes and, and gets the, the weight off of you that you're not struggling anymore. He, he racks the weight and you're like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that, Jesus. And the headphones go back in and we go away until we struggle again and need him to step in again to take this weight off of us. And so there's these different versions, I think, that we can create. And maybe there's even a different version that you feel like you have had in your life at, at now or at some other point. But the thing that, that I don't want us to miss that I think that some of the people worshiping Jesus, even in this moment, and Luke had missed, was that they didn't get to decide who Jesus was. Right? They, they didn't get to decide if there was going to be some version of Jesus that was going to meet all of their needs or that was going to meet all of their requirements, that was going to, going to set them up because they had just decided that Jesus was going to do these things. Jesus is who he says he is. And so we can spend our whole lives creating a version of Jesus that meets all of our specifications, but we're going to miss out on the true Jesus that meets all of our needs. Because the Jesus that meets our specifications is probably going to feel pretty comfortable. He's probably not going to ask us to do anything uncomfortable. He's not going to ask us to, to step out and trust him with anything. That He's going to be there to, to agree with us and back us up. But the true Jesus is actually what leads us to life. The true Jesus is the one that meets all of the needs that we have and the ones that we don't even know that we have, that steps in to bring us life because he is who he says he is. That that is the Jesus that we um, get to experience but as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem, and you had all these people who were saying, he's the Lord, whether their intentions were good or misplaced or whatever it was, there were people who were worshiping Jesus, uh, and they were excited about this Messiah coming into Jerusalem. Not everybody was excited, because there was, there was a whole group of religious rulers that, that we know as the Pharisees, and they were not excited about this guy coming in to set everybody free, because they had power over those people. And so if those people were free, they now lost their power. And so they may have seen him as a, a liar or a lunatic, but they ultimately saw Jesus as a threat. Because if Jesus was going to come in and actually do what he said, then that would mean they would lose all of the power they had over the people around them, not realizing that Jesus was also coming to set them free as well. That Jesus' grace was for everybody, and they were missing out on it because they wanted to hold on to their power and hold on to these things for themselves. And we see this interaction as, as again, it's, it's, it's like a Super Bowl parade of people worshiping Jesus, and, and they're, that's why it's called Palm Sunday. They're waving palms around that they're, they are worshiping, and it's, it's, it's this really um, crazy experience. And uh, these, these Pharisees come in, and they miss out on this whole thing because they're only worried about themselves. And so I love this interaction, and, uh, and they, they come up to Jesus and ask him in verse 39. It says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And then Jesus replies, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. That I, I love that interaction, because these Pharisees are saying, hey, all of these people are saying that you're God and that you are king, and they can't do that. Like, you have to get them to stop. And Jesus doesn't shy away from it. He doesn't, he doesn't uh, just fall into what the Pharisees are saying. Jesus is even doubling down again on who he says that he is. And he tells the Pharisees, look, even if all of these people left and were just silent and no one was worshiping me, even the rocks would cry out and worship. The, the, uh, a couple months ago, we had a, a men's retreat. And the speaker at the retreat said this one phrase that sums all of this up, uh, but it was, it was a short phrase, but there's so much behind it, where he said that we don't put God first. God is first. Or like, like you can't just put God first in your life because God is first over everything. There's nothing that we can do that, that puts God somewhere in this place where he has power or where he is able to do things. That God is in a place of power. God is in the, the first place in all of creation. And so we don't get to actually put him there. He already is there. 
And, and so what, what these Pharisees didn't realize was that, that they, they were making the wrong decisions in this. And, and just like them, that there are decisions that we can make about Jesus where you can be in here this morning and you can decide to not worship. You know, you can decide to not follow Jesus. You can decide to not be in a small group and be a part of community and discipleship. And, and you can decide all of these things, but none of your decisions change who Jesus is. None of your decisions change the fact that Jesus is king. That Jesus just is who he says that he is. And none of your decisions can change that. And thank God. <laughs> like if we can make decisions that change who God is, I don't think that's a God any of us want to follow. That we don't follow a God who is, is weak and is swayed by our decisions or what we think or what we want. We follow a God who is powerful and who is outside of us and who has all of the power in the universe to do what he wants to do. But what he decides to do is he decides to see us and love us and rescue us. That that is what God decides to do with his power. And we, we come to this place where we, we have to realize that we don't get to decide if Jesus is king. We just decide if we're going to recognize Jesus as king. That you don't decide and I don't decide if God is, is king or if he is over everything or if he is in his rightful place. We can only decide if we're going to recognize that as true. And so I got to that place in my life. Where, where I thought that maybe church wasn't for me. I thought that God wasn't for me because I had the wrong view of what that was. And again, being in my friend's car, thinking religion was only for people who were afraid of dying. And I didn't realize that I was already dead. Like I, didn't, I, I thought that I'd outsmarted God. And what I realized was that I was dead and that I didn't even have life. That I, I thought that I had things figured out, but if you looked at my life, I was anxious and depressed and struggling with drugs and alcohol, and I couldn't have a healthy relationship, that, that I, I thought I had outsmarted my need for God, and the whole time I was just dead and had no hope and no life in me at all. And so the single greatest decision I've ever made in my life was deciding to recognize Jesus as king, because that is the decision that led to life that is the decision that led to healing. That is the decision that led to the beginning of the rest of my life because I realized that God actually is good, that God does actually love us, that God does want to sin and did send his son to rescue us. But let me be absolutely clear that the only reason we can make that decision is because God first decided to love us. That the only reason that we can decide to follow Jesus is because before you ever made the last mistake that you made, before you, you did maybe made decisions that you feel like derailed your entire life, that before you were even born, God looked down and, and saw who you were, who you were going to be, and decided that it was worth it to send his son to die for you because he wants to bring you to himself. That God decided before anything else that he was going to send Jesus. He was going to send this Messiah, not to free us from, from Roman oppression. He was going to come free us from death. That he was sending his son to die in your place so that the struggle that you have, the addiction that you have, and the thing that you're walking around with doesn't bring you to death anymore, but he actually can bring you to life. That that is the decision that we have to make. And so the question for us today is, are we going to continue worshiping a version of Jesus, or are we going to worship Jesus? Are we going to worship a version that we've created in our own minds that, that maybe just feels comfortable, or it's maybe just what we've always known, or it's, it's, it's just the, the thing that we kind of revert back to when life starts to get difficult? Or are we going to worship the true Jesus? Are we going to worship the Jesus that comes and brings life? The, the Jesus that even if we are silent, the rocks will cry out in our place. The true Jesus that, that saw our brokenness and saw what we were dealing with and saw just the ways that we were going up into death and decided that he wanted something different for us. Are we, so are we going to worship a version that is always incomplete and void of life? Or are we going to worship the true Jesus? that came not to, to get anything for himself, but it came to give you everything that you could ever need. That that is the Jesus that we get to worship today. And so there's a, a card in your seat uh, with some action steps on it that, 
that we don't want to go through Sunday mornings and, and uh, just hear some things or just spend some time together and then leave, that we want to make some decisions together and to, to go out this week being changed by who God is and what God has done. And so we can make some decisions even here right now. And the first one um, on your card is that we can decide to follow Jesus. That, that if you've never made that decision or if you were like me and felt like church wasn't for you or that God wasn't for you, um, that, that you can decide today to follow Jesus. That he loves you and he knows you and he wants a relationship with you. Uh, the second one is you can get baptized at Easter. Uh, that we're going to have a ton of opportunities to get baptized uh, next Sunday and Saturday. Uh, a couple of services um, here on Saturday at Brooks Loop, three on Sunday, and two at the movie theater. We're going to be baptizing people at the movie theater next Sunday morning. And so there's, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And so you can, uh, you can decide to get baptized at Easter if that's a step that you haven't taken yet. Uh, the third is that you can decide to recognize Jesus as king. That maybe you've been living with, with a different version of Jesus in your mind that because maybe you think that, that you can get something from Jesus or maybe you think you have to earn your way back to him because of things that you've experienced and what you've gone through. And you just want to recognize Jesus as king, that he is first and the rest of our lives falls into place from there. And then last, um, we can decide to invite someone to Easter. There are some cards in your seats that, that um, for our service times and the locations— and maybe you're in here and you're like, man, I've already experienced this grace from Jesus. I've experienced what God has done. And now is your time to invite somebody to Easter so that they can experience what you already have. That they now get to experience going from death to life because of who Jesus is. But no matter what your next step is today on that card or anything you feel like God calling you to um, today, no matter what that step is, I believe God is doing something huge in Alaska. I think that there is a move of God happening right around us. And I also think that God wants you to be a part of it. And so let's pray together and ask God to show up here today and every day going forward as we ask him to be a part of what is happening here. So Jesus, we thank you for who you are. God, thank you that you are first. God, that there is nothing that we can do um, to change your mind about us there's some decision that we can make that would sway you. God, thank you that you are first and that you are powerful. And Jesus, we, we thank you that you have decided to love us. God, that before any decision that we made, any mistake that we've made, before anything has ever even happened in our life, God, you decided to give us a way back to you. And so Jesus, we just pray this morning that you would be here in this place. God, we just pray that you would show up. God, we pray that that you would be here in our midst, God, because we, we recognize that, that we don't have as much power as we think, and you have more than we could ever imagine. And so, God, we pray that you would be here, that you would show up, and, God, that you would have your way. God, just please receive all the worship and glory and praise and everything that we have to offer you this morning, not because we need to earn something from you, but, God, because you deserve it for what you have already done for us. And so, God, we love you, we thank you, and in your name we pray. Amen. As we continue in worship today, um, we're going to have our prayer team come up here, and they'll be standing here. Um, just if you guys need any kind of prayer, you just feel something heavy on your heart, they're ready to pray for you. So just come on up, and they'll be they'll be right here waiting. We want to hear what you uh, what you've gone through. We're here for you. So can you guys please stand, and we're going to continue in worship.
continue in worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And there are several different ways that you guys can give listed on the screen behind me. Yeah, in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Paul says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And Paul just says, God loves a cheerful giver. But the reality is, he does not need our money. But he absolutely delights and he absolutely loves when we trust in him with everything, including our finances. And I know for me, as a 16-year-old teenage girl, it could be so tempting to want to take my tithe and go shopping and get myself a cute new shirt. But my Heavenly Father is so gracious, and he reminds me that tithing is so much more meaningful than some material shirt. Yeah, so good. I love, yeah, you can celebrate that. I love, at 16 years old, you're recognizing who Jesus is in your finances and in your life. And y'all, I started giving when I was in my 20s and I wasn't cheerful, I was fearful. I was like, Lord, but something happens when we trust God with our money. When we say, you're Lord of not just my family and my life, but my finances as well. And you guys, when you give, you are expanding the kingdom of God. You're not giving to a building or an organization. You're giving into the things of eternity so that people can experience the hands and feet of Jesus. And we say this all the time. You don't give to us, but you're literally giving through us to expand Jesus' name. So just thank you guys so much. Well, Easter is a week away. Woo! Are they ready? I don't know, are you guys ready? Yeah. Woo! Well, as we get ready to go into Easter, we wanna keep you guys updated with everything happening at ACF. We will not be having a Wednesday gathering this week in preparation for our services, but we will be having two Good Friday services at 5.30 and at seven. And we'll have childcare available for first grade and down, but if your child's older than that, we're gonna ask them to join us in service. And guys, these services are probably gonna be packed, so we recommend that you get here early this is one of my favorite gatherings that we do. Yeah, and we are going to be having five services at ACF, two on Saturday and three on Sunday. And we're going to be having two at the movie theater, which is so hype. Like, what? <laughs> so, so good. And Ashton, as we go into Easter, how should people prepare? Yes, yeah, so I have a challenge for everybody in the room. I want everybody to think of one person in your life that does not know Jesus. Yeah, get that name in your mind, on your heart. And that is the person that you need to invite to one of these Easter services because your invitation matters. God can move through your obedience and through your yes to him. So I encourage all of you to take um, that invitation card and give it to that person. Watch God move. Yeah, and this could be the person at the checkout at Kroger. This could be your next door neighbor, but this person has a name and a story. And we want to build the kingdom of God because he tells the best story. And one final thing, we are going back to Mexico as a church. Yes. And we are so excited. And if you guys don't know, we go and build a home for a family. This family is typically living in some type of shack or shed. Um, and we go down as a youth group and literally give them a two bedroom house. And this changes things for generations. And we wanna invite you to join us on mission. Outside, we have over 200 envelopes with different dollar amounts on them. And when you grab one of these envelopes, you're committing to give that amount. And once all of these envelopes are gone, we will have a fully funded home. Yes, yeah, we can celebrate that. This home is, is roughly like $12,000. Um, and so, again, this family is changed. And I know you went on the trip. How was that experience for you? Man, it was just so eye-opening because they were living in such just horrible conditions. But God answered their prayer, and he sent us to take care of them. And it's through your generosity that we are able to do that. And it just provided them security and answered prayer. And it was just so, so beautiful. So make sure you grab an envelope. They're gonna be out on the patio. This is our last weekend doing that, so we'd love for you to partner with us. Well, would you guys go ahead and stand up as we close out in prayer?
God, thank you so much for you. God, I pray that this week worship would just arise in our hearts. God, the rocks are crying out, and I pray that we would cry out for the goodness and glory and, and power of the living God. Lord, as we go to our homes, as we, God, go to our schools and the different things around us, God, let us see people who need to know the kindness and goodness and truth of Jesus. God, give us boldness to invite them to Easter, God, and, and trust you with their yes or with their no. But God, we want to be ministers of the kingdom. Lord, don't let us remain silent this week. Um, whether in praise and invitation, thanksgiving, whatever that looks like, God, we want to be used by you, and we know your favorite way to move is through your people. And so, Holy Spirit, embolden us, send us out, and may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, King Jesus. We ask this in your precious and holy and mighty name. Amen. Thank you, guys. We love you all. Thank you.